uh, damage can be repaired. Uh, single strand break is the main the, the cellular damage that uh, is repairable, and this is uh, uh, predominant for uh, uh, low LET radiation, and the cells have good repair uh, machinery for DNA damage repair. Okay, normal tissue radio sensitivity is another intervening factor in radiotherapy. Some tissues are uh, radio sensitive, uh, such as bone marrow cells and embryonic cells. Some are with moderate uh, radio sensitivity, like kidney and livers, and some are uh, uh, radio resistant, like. Uh, nerve cells. Inherent radio sensitivity uh, is another factor to be uh, considered. Uh, at clinical uh, level, observation is different from normal tissues and at cellular level. Uh, fractionation used in routine radiotherapy leads to five hours that is reoxygenation of hypoxic cells, redistribution of cells in the cell cycle, repair of subletal damage, repopulation of tumor cells after irradiation, and also radiosensitivity of tumor tissues. Use of predictive assays is important for uh, predicting tumor response to radiation in uh, Clinical situation, use of chemical radio protectors is important for protection of normal tissue. Uh, also, use of radio synthesizers is important to enhance the effect of radiation. All of these effects uh, occurring at cellular level are mainly due to DNA double strand breaks. I, emphasis on DNA damage because our ultimate goal is to discuss about uh, what we can uh, gain with DNA damage after ionizing radiation. Uh, okay, I have mentioned about DNA damage earlier, but I repeat it here to emphasize that many genes as several processes will be activated after induction of double strand breaks. When a double strand break is induced after ionizing radiation or uh, directly or indirectly by uh, free radicals, cells try to repair a uh, double strand break by activation of several genes, arresting cells at different phases of the cell cycle to allow double strand break to be repaired. If repair of double strand break was not successful, then other genes will be activated and the cells enter in apoptotic uh, pathway, which leads the cells to program cell death, uh, or ultimately the apoptosis. All these activities in cells are done for maintaining genome stability. Uh, if a, a double strand break repair is Repair. If a double strand break damage is repaired, it maintains the genome stability. If a damaged cell is eliminated from the tissue, uh, also is uh, maintaining genome stability, stability in uh, cellular uh, environment and uh, tissue. If this process is unsuccessful, then we will have genome instability. Genome instability will lead to gene mutation, which uh, lead to microsatellite instability, cell cycle checkpoint perturbance, chromosomal instability, and uh, cell death or apoptosis. Genome instability is the key player in various biological phenomena that occur in tumor uh, environment after irradiation. These processes and uh, our uh, radio adaptation, uh, which uh, makes cells uh, more radio resistant or by a standard effect uh, that uh, does not obey the uh, target theory, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, unheated cells might suffer uh, uh, little damage even an inherent radio sensitivity. Uh, all these phenomena affects radiotherapy outcome if occur in uh, after in tumors after irradiation. All the above mentioned the phenomena were the achievement of radiobiology at cellular level. However, with the advent of modern high throughput technologies used in molecular biology and genetics, radiobiology entered in the era of big data, radiogenomics. Radiogenomics is the study of the link between germline genotypic variations and the large classical, uh, clinical variability observed in response to radiation therapy. The aim of radiogenomics is to identify the alleles that underlies the inherited dissimilarities in phenotypes of uh, patients. Uh, radiogenomics is used in two contexts. One refers to the study of genetic variation associated with response to radiation, uh, that is radiation genomics. The other one is uh, referring to the correlation between cancer imaging features and gene expression imaging genomics. Also some add another context to this category, pathogenomics, correlating genomic information to pathologic data. Uh, in radio, uh, radiation genomics, radiogenomics is used to refer to the uh, genetic variation associated with, with response to radiation therapy. Genetic variation such as uh, single nucleotide polymorphism, SNP, is a study in relation to a cancer patient's uh, risk of development, developing toxicity following radiation therapy. Lots of experimental works uh, and bioinformatic works has been done on SNP to find out how uh, normal tissue uh, toxicity will be uh, will be induced or uh, uh, could be predicted uh, after uh, radiation therapy in normal tissue. It is also used in the context of studying the genomics of, uh, of tumors response to radiation therapy. The addition of genomic data in the uh, uh, last 20 years, including DNA, microarray information, microRNAs, RNA sequencing data, allo allows new correlations to be made between cellular genomics and response to radiotherapy. Uh, uh, we currently use uh, some type of biomarkers as a pillar of the precision oncology. Uh, biomarkers can be used to inform diagnosis and prognosis or to select appropriate therapy. At present, for example, we use PSA level for prostate cancer. We use oncotype DX recurrence score or mammoprint for breast cancer. EGFR activation mutation, MSI, etc. All these uh, biomarkers are used uh, currently, but all these are tissue specific, requires tissue sampling by invasive surgical methods, may be biased because of a small portion of tumor tissue is studied, may be incomplete because does not show tumor physiology. Other uh, Markers used to bio, bio monitor, uh, for biomonitoring of tumor tissues for appropriate radiotherapy in use uh, currently is tumor oxygenation monitoring using ependroporops, uh, different schemes of um, fractionation, radio sensitivity testing with colony assay on tumor cells, and uh, a study of inherent radio sensitivity, uh, sensitivity of patients using G0 and G2 assay. Uh, these are current uh, methods used to determine tumor radio sensitivity of patients. 
uh, this is colony assay uh, for to use for SF2 uh, determination uh, survival fraction of cells, the tumor cells at uh, two gray. Uh, we use G0 micronuclei assay and G2 chromosomal aberration assay to determine uh, radio sensitivity of patients, which uh, is seen for some uh, cancer patients. For example, 40% of breast cancer patients are radio sensitive. These methods uh, provide limited information, so it would be hard to predict tumor response to radiation, and the early and late effects might occur in normal tissue that we cannot predict with using these uh, methods. In a radiogenomic study, we know that many genes are activated following irradiation in cells. Following uh, one double strand break uh, induction after uh, exposure to ionizing radiation. These genes either upregulate or downregulate after irradiation. As seen in the slide, different gene groups from different pathways. For example, from DNA repair pathway, we have several genes uh, are activated in homologous recombination uh, repair system. And we have several genes activated uh, after induction of double strand break uh, uh, in uh, non-homologous and joining repair system. We have genes in apoptosis pathway, we have genes in cell cycle arrest pathway, we have genes uh, in signal transduction and infl inflammatory uh, pathway, different uh, interleukins, uh, TNF and uh, TGF and so on. Either gene or groups of genes can be considered as biomarker for radiation res response of tumors. Uh, to do uh, a study on uh, a study on in radiogenomic, we can use samples obtained by liquid biopsy instead of the tumor tissue. Liquid biopsy from, for example, blood, urine, sputum, saliva is reliable, non-invasive methods for uh, cancer detection and prediction of cancer uh, uh, tumor response to radiation, less trauma, and generally less risk to patients, especially those who are not candidates for invasive biopsy. Signatures of patients' tumors can be characterized molecularly, aids in understanding tumor biology, and may be the best tool for monitoring therapeutic response and perhaps early detection. Repeated sampling is possible. Uh, with tissue biopsy, this is difficult or impossible to carry out in some cases. Uh, methods used for uh, a genomic biomarkers for radiation response is different. Uh, they are all high throughput methods that provide large amounts of data, like next, next genera uh, generation sequencing for whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing, CGH array, DNA microarray, RNA sequencing. These are all rapid high throughput profiling and uh, are uh, uh, carried out with reduced cost genomic and epigenomic information can be obtained from tumors before and after radiotherapy as biomarker by these methods are gene expression data, microRNA expression, long non-coding RNA expression, circular RNA expression, all those, uh, these markers are associated with the specific genes and act in different pathways, uh, such as DNA repair, apoptosis, inflammation, and uh, signal transduction pathway. This is an example of uh, only one no uh, long non-coding RNA, which uh, is 
involved uh, uh, to influence uh, different genes and different microRNAs after uh, exposure to radiation. And this is also showing that different circular RNAs in breast cancer are acting in different, uh, at different mechanisms. For, for example, cell death and apoptosis, proliferation, migration and metastasis, resistance to chemotherapy and uh, so on. Uh, this slide uh, shows practical use of radiogenomics and radiotherapy. Liquid biopsy is obtained from a uh, prostate cancer patient. MicroRNA is uh, studied with one of those uh, methods uh, mentioned earlier. MicroRNA signature predicts tumor grades, whether it's low grade or high grade, if it is high grade, mere signature predicts its risk of radiotherapy. It determines it, uh, it is radiosensitive or not. If uh, mere signature predicts radiosensitive tumor, then uh, radiotherapy plan is used normally. But if it shows that uh, uh, the tumor is radioresistant, different radiotherapy modalities may be used or uh, uh, can be, radiotherapy can be avoided. Another features of uh, radiogenomics is imaging genomics. I just uh, summarized in this one slide, correlation of imaging data obtained by CT, MRI, MRI, PET scan, uh, to tissue pathology and genetic profiles, including data obtained by DNA microarrays, uh, microRNAs, DNA, sequ DNA RNA sequencing, allows new correlation to be made between cellular and tissue scale imaging. But uh, lots of work is uh, has been done and is now being uh, doing on this uh, features of imaging gen uh, genomics, but there are limitations of uh, imaging genomics because, tissue, because of tissue heterogeneity. A few cases with pure history uh, uh, should, uh, would be have um, an sampling bias in inability to tumor mapping uh, uh, with uh, in this uh, uh, imaging genomics. However, the ultimate goal of uh, radiogenomics in either case radiation genomics or imaging geno genomics in cancer treatment is to achieve 4 p medicine. 4 p medicine in cancer treatment can be summarized as prediction of tumor response to uh, radiation, prevention of normal tissue toxicity, uh, uh, early or late effect, personalized radiotherapy based on the uh, added frequency or uh, other uh, genetic data obtained by the methods, and participatory or patient-centered treatment. Uh, thank you very much for your kind patience and attention to my presentation. Uh, I'm here to answer your question if there is. Thank you, <coughs> Professor Hossein Mosgarani, for an excellent talk on uh, from classical radiobiology what we are learning for this, since uh, uh, 100 years from that radiobiology to radiogenomics and personalized radiotherapy, how it can work, and four Ps of the cancer treatment prediction to prevention to personalized and participatory thing. A excellent talk on the biology development. You are one of the experts in radiobiology. Thanks for uh, uh, this talk. Now, actually, in the beginning, uh, Professor Thomas Kran was to give the feedback of the first webinar, uh, the, the uh, IPOM school webinar. So I am asking him 
to give just two minutes he will take it and then after that again you can take over and start moderating we have not received any questions yet hopefully we can take it afterwards uh, the questions so uh, professor thomas are you there yeah you can unmute yes thank thank you very much arun uh, and thank you very much for this fantastic uh, presentation uh, we just uh, uh, we are witnessing uh, this is really a new world uh, for us as medical physicists, uh, and I think it is an, uh, a world we all need to become familiar with in order to uh, maintain our uh, close collaboration with our clinical friends and colleagues. These summer schools are a wonderful opportunity for us to catch up uh, with all sorts of things. And I would like to thank you all very much for participating in the summer schools. I would just like to give a bit of feedback of the first summer school we ran on the 22nd of July, uh, where we had uh, four presentations from my institution on, brain, on a variety of different topics, radiobiology, uh, much, much more basic than what we had here, uh, linear accelerator QA, shielding, and radiation safety. Uh, and as you may recall, uh, I asked people to send to answer some questions and sent me the results. I am delighted to report that we had 45 answers, uh, which basically means about 30% of the participants handed in their uh, answer, shield, answer sheet, which I think is a tremendous response uh, form. I should particularly thank the colleagues from Malaysia who topped the list, but we had responses from 14 countries, uh, uh, including uh, ob obviously uh, India, uh, Indonesia, all the AFOM countries. So I'm very proud uh, about that. On average, uh, about uh, uh, three quarters of the participants answered the required questions correctly. Uh, and uh, we will repeat this again uh, in our next, uh, uh, in the next summer school in December. And whoever will, after all our uh, Peter Max summer schools, will have 60% uh, of questions answered correctly, will get a certificate. Uh, and uh, I will inform participants, though, uh, individually of their outcome uh, in, in these uh, results. Uh, but I would like to, to thank AFOM, and I'd like to thank all the participants for their active participation overall. Interestingly enough, uh, it turns out that the shielding questions and the radiation safety questions are the most complicated ones, apparently. Uh, everyone answered the radiobiology and Linux QA correctly, but shielding and radiation safety are a bit more tricky. Uh, so uh, we, within the IFOMP Science Committee, are working on some additional uh, contributions which we can potentially make in order to fill that gap if it exists. Thank you very much for allowing me uh, to give that feedback uh, and uh, thank you for these wonderful presentations. Thank you, Professor uh, Thomas Cron, for giving the feedback of the APOM School webinar. And it is very, very important to receive the feedback from the participant so as to plan the further uh, uh, webinars and all. So meanwhile, I have received two, three questions I will put to Professor Hussein, and then we can go ahead. Uh, the one question is, uh, difference between P2 and P3 as radiotherapy aims to spare healthy tissue. Uh, professor, just be lost, I think. Professor Hossein, I'm seeing I just uh, lost. Okay, anyway, anyway, uh, we'll join us again. So we move ahead and uh, uh, we go to the next talk, and that will be on the advanced techniques of radiotherapy from conformal to IMRT to SRT and SBRT to ART and beyond. And this will be by Professor E.I. Parsai from Toledo, Ohio, USA. And I'm very happy that he has joined 
at the three o'clock in the early morning from USA. And I'm able to see Hossein Mozarani is there. Uh, please, you can unmute uh, Professor Hossein and uh, you may be having the introduction slide. Uh, you can introduce. I can take the question afterwards uh, if permitted, or I can just go to the question you are there. So first question was on the uh, difference between P2 and P3 as RT aims to spare the healthy tissue. That's a question from uh, Muhammad Muhammadi. Uh, can you? Professor Hossein? Yes, uh, do you hear me? I, yeah, I yeah, yeah. hear you, yes. Uh, I think uh, we have to go in this way for uh, better treatment uh, of cancer. Uh, you know, there is a, a radiogenomic consortium for doing this, uh, all these works uh, established in NIH and about uh, 123 uh, uh, scientists are working in this group from 26 countries and about 40 institutes. They are all working on radiogenomics, both in genomics, uh, radiation genomics, and in uh, imaging genomics to find out how we can improve uh, the prediction of uh, especially uh, late and early toxicity of radiotherapy. Because you know, uh, one of the main limitation in radiotherapy is late toxicity of normal tissues, uh, recurrence of cancers and or uh, some other things. Uh, uh, that's why we have to continue this uh, research and works for better uh, cancer treatment. Uh, in this regard, I only don't... another question is there and that is on the future of uh, radiomics how it would revolutionize or change the present setup for radiotherapy, uh, if there is any. That is a question, a continuation of the question, which uh, for some moment- It's has the asked. same, uh, radiogenomics uh, or radiomics uh, is the same as radio, uh, radiogenomics. Uh, we are in the beginning, but uh, we have to gather data from different patients, different cancers to, to, and different radiotherapy modalities to connect with the imaging genomics to see whether it's working or not. Uh, we are at the beginning now, and we have to continue this work. Okay, thank you so much. So now you can uh, introduce uh, Professor Parasai and uh, continue the moderating uh, uh, these talks. Okay. Uh, do you have uh, slides? My slides uh, for Professor Parsai. Do you see my slides? No, you, you have to still share it. You have, you have not shared. Click it and share it. Yeah. We are seeing your screen where the three. Uh, yeah, now it's up. Next. Okay. You can go to the I'm PPT pleased to introduce. Uh, okay, I'm pleased to introduce the next sp speaker of this uh, webinar, Professor Parsai, Professor of Radiation. Uh, uh, actually, I could summarize this uh, introductory uh, slides uh, from a huge uh, CV. I hope uh, I did uh, or I selected the, the one that Professor Parsai was uh, meant to. Professor uh, Parsai is Professor of Radiation Oncology, Director of uh, Graduate Medical Physics Program and Chief of Medical Physics Division, University of Toledo Health Science Campus, Department of Radiation Oncology. Professor Parsai has issued uh, eight uh, US patents and four provisional patents. He published over 72 papers and presented uh, 172 published abstracts. And he's the author of six books, co-authored uh, 
Emitel Dictionary of Medical Physics and authored entire Oxford Dictionary to Persian language and created, created a new dictionary known today as Parsa Dictionary. Professor Parsai received uh, lots of US grant, uh, more than 4 million uh, US dollars for his, uh, his research, received the award of excellence for the best radiation measurement article in 2016, uh, and the Astro's first place award for poster in 2010. Uh, Uh, Professor Parsai is director of uh, CAMPEP Accredited Medical Physics Program at UT. Initiated PhD degree program uh, through the Toledo Department of Physics and Astronomy. Professor Parsai has experience of teaching courses in radiation oncology physics in the last 27 years. President of Society of Directors of Academy medical physics programs, STAMPP, currently serving as the chairman of the board for the society. Uh, he, he has been oral examiner of American Board of Radio, Radiology, member of editorial board, AMP newsletter, and member of IOMP publication committee. Uh, Professor Parsai is editor of the Medical Physics World, the IOMP Bulletin, invited lecturers, seminars, symposia, visiting for professorships, and many others. You can uh, visit uh, Professor Parsai's CV in his, uh, uh, his website. Okay, we are with you, Professor Parsai. Thank you so very much for this kind introduction. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, how do I share my screen? Can Tom? Uh, uh, how do I share my screen? Is there a? There, there, there is an icon, green icon. Share screen is in green. So you can place on that and then. Yes, share the screen, yes. Oh, there it is. I just see it. I just yeah. see it. Mm. OK. If you move your cursor to the bottom of the screen it will it will unhide are you see are you able to see my screen no mm. no not yet did, have you found the the share screen button uh yeah i did um there now it's coming uh, yeah now it's coming yes. no. okay oh yeah it does it does it is it is now yes. Do you see my slide? Yes, no. yes. We have okay, wonderful. Slides. Yeah, you can go to the PPT mode. Yeah. Yes, welcome. Fine. It's been a great pleasure that I'll be speaking on the oh. topic of advanced this is... technologies of radiation therapy mm -hmm. today. And of course, the concentration of my talk is on photons, advancements in various other modalities and techniques of radiation oncology. It's not in the patience of this 30 minute uh, presentation. Before I start, uh, I'd like to thank all volunteer members of the AFAM, Professor uh, Chudley, and my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Jin uh, from China, who put together this series of uh, school webinars. I would also like to express my sincere thanks to my colleague and friend, Dr. Mazarani from University of Tehran who initiated this particular webinar and gave me an opportunity to give this presentation. Let me move this away. So understanding the biological features of delivered radiation dose is a key in success of radiation oncology. 
for many years, the field of radiation oncology was truly missing uh, data or guidelines for levels of radiation dose to the organs at risk, or even to the tumors for proper control. The following keystone publications I have listed here um, brought some order to this chaos, if you will. In 1974, Dr. Phil Rubin, who was the founding editor of Red Journal, uh, randomly came up with, from based on his own experience, defining the 5% and 50% tolerance doses for five years. That was so basic and so critical that even um, Imami during 1990s did not change it when he came up with TCP and TCP table for 26 various organs. And also in 2009, Quantec, uh, which was uh, really based on a lot more data from uh, perhaps hundreds of uh, sites around the world, and did not change that particular number that uh, Dr. Rubin had come up with that still exists in Quantec data. So we kept all of that information and continued uh, treating patients with them until um, recent years where the hypofractionated treatment became a reality and uh, neither one of those two sets of data had anything to say um, about the um, uh, NTCP. In 2020, HITECH uh, was published in Red Journal, and it is, uh, it is a paper that everyone should have a chance to look at. Also in 2019 and 2020, there is a work in progress on the next set of uh, data that will be published uh, for future use uh, under the title of PENTECH, which is for pediatric normal tissue effect in the clinic. So, looking at some historical um, review of radiobiology, it was demonstrated that multi-fraction radiation therapy was more effective than a single fraction. This created a beneficial difference effect between cancer and normal tissue. A few years later, in 1934, Porter uh, and colleagues proposed fractionation, a scheme of 200 rankton per fraction. Uh, and suggested five-day uh, fraction per week. This was later uh, converted into the standard uh, contemporary two grade per fraction per day and five days a week scheme. So these early clinical uh, and radiobiological observations led to the development of basic principle and fractionated practice of conventional external beam radiotherapy, which lasted as long as it has even until today, where we treat uh, patients with 25 to 30 fractions in four to six weeks, and typical uh, dose fractionation is 1.8 to 2 grade per fraction, and those folks laid the foundation of conventional multi-fractionated radio therapy. For many years, then, the tradition continued. Uh, and the dose for most of the organs was taken up to 60 to 70 Great. We now uh, know that the radio sensitivity of tumor, of course, varies greatly in different tumor types and differences in pathology and cellular differentiation, etc. And that information was missing. Consequently, the expected effect was hardly observed under the conventional multifractionated external beam radiation therapy for the treatment of those tumors that are more radio resistant, such as adenocarcinoma of the lung, pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, melanoma, renal cancer, and soft tissue sarcoma. The stereotactic body radiotherapy data was uh, published originally from University of Indiana uh, by Timmerman and colleagues. Uh, that data showed that the substantial evidence that we have had until now for all of these decades may not be really the optimal of tumors. So in 1951, 
then the first introduction of uh, stereotactic radio surgery using gamma rays was conceived by um, um, Lexel. And in 1967, the first gamma knife was actually clinical in Karolinska Institute and I started treating patients at the rate of 15 to 25 gray uh, in single fraction. A few years later, that scheme showed high local control uh, and it had continued until today. Framed stereotactic radio surgery became available using a cone system in most of the sites, at least I know of here in the US. And then later on, a miniature multi leaf collimation system, which could have been retrofitted to the head of the uh, linear accelerators, um, was developed uh, somewhere around 1993. Uh, quite a few companies actually built those machines, and then they would go around the country and retrofit these M MMLCs to the head of the older machine. One of the companies that we bought that MMLC from in 1993 exactly was called the 3D Line Company. And it was later on purchased by the Electa. So stereotactic body radiotherapy did not occur until 2002 when Timmerman and his group used um, SBRT for treatment of inoperable early stage lung cancer and reported the results. Then in the last two decades, um, explosion of technologies um, moved us to really where we are. Those technologies include um, uh, invention of high dose rate um, with the existence of triple F beams, taking the dose rate from 600 centigrade a minute to 2400 centigrade a minute, rate per minute for 10 MV beams and invention of intensity modulated radiation therapy, IGRT, 4D simulation, gating during the treatment, the miniature multi-leaves, and also high definition multi-leaves that were actually part of the accelerators, um, existence of advanced treatment planning algorithms such as multi-criteria optimization technology developed by Ray Station, uh, along with availability of really fast computers and processors uh, brought the radiation oncology technology to where it is today. And uh, indeed, it has been a revolution in the past two decades in the field. Uh, in late 80s, uh, 3D conformal radiotherapy became also a big turning point. By 3D conformal radiotherapy, we meant um, uh, existence of a three-dimensional CT scan in, uh, in the treatment planning systems. And then um, looking at the beam's eye view from different angles that the gantry was coming in and uh, uh, creating um, the margin around the field to uh, be able to further spare the surrounding normal tissue, but more importantly, to deliver the needed uh, dose to the target. Now, these uh, 3D conformal radiotherapy at the time uh, could have been um, just the straight beams, or we would have been able to use uh, modulated fluence. And modulated, I don't mean using um, IMRT, but rather uh, putting uh, wedges or compensators that are that were handmade into the path of the beam. Again, that's another way to modulate the beam and um, and create a dose distribution or shift the dose um, to different places by uh, with that technology or that technique. The resultant dose distribution typically conform to the target volume in 3D space. Uh, and the organs at risk and the surrounding normal tissue were getting a little less compared to compared to before 3D conformal therapy had become a reality. The picture you see here is a plan that uh, we picked up an algorithm 
for the treatment planning uh, from NIH. Uh, George Ross had developed it uh, from the University of North Carolina, I believe. And it was a free shareware, so we put Motive Window on it, and then we created this treatment planning system in 1992 or three here at the University of Toledo. Uh, we called it VRS Plan, which meant Virtual Real Simulation Plan. And it was very popular at the time. Um, forward planning, or what is known as field in field planning, also was popular, particularly for the case of breast, where we could create a smaller field and, and uh, take care of low dose spots or um, um, give better uniformity within the field as it was needed. The 3D conformal therapy um, didn't have to be um, coplanar. As you can see, this is a plan I personally did many, many years ago, and it's a non-coplanar plan. And the tumor is uh, at, the left, at, the, at the left frontal brain of, of this patient. And then the PTV is shown in red. And as you can see, the 100% isodose line is yellow, is covering the entire PTV. Um, the, the, the problem with this plan compared to today is we are achieving a good coverage for the tumor, but the dose to the structure that are in nearby vicinity of the tumor are not acceptable by today's standard. As you can see, the 50% isodose line is going through half of the brain stem, and this is really not acceptable in today's uh, dosimetry treatment planning. This is another plan that uh, we did then, which is really showing a tumor um, behind the um, vertebrae and uh, leading on the spinal cord. So the the dose shaping, as I said, was being done, at least the, the program that we had, uh, we created a number of uh, uh, automated um, uh, features, such as expansion of the PTV, uh, or even manual adjustment of the PTV, let's say on the rectum side, if you wanted to put less versus the other side, we would have been able to do that. Uh, to, to manage the dose to the organs at risk, also to um, have enough margin to cover the given PTV. Later, of course, the multi leaf collimator system became available and uh, was used to shape the uh, target. And this is, again, another one we had created. Other companies, manufacturers of uh, other treatment planning systems um, also created similar. Uh, it's interesting to note how generous these margins are, again, compared to today. We don't hardly have such margin in any treatment planning, uh, looking at the beam's eye view of various targets. This is really the, the times have changed quite a bit. Uh, here shown really the room's eye view, we called it room's eye view, to get the practical sense and an idea about the geometry of the beam placement. Now, <clears throat> um, Imami and colleagues, when they published their uh, TCP and TC and was used, um, that was. Uh, Complication. As you can see, let's say if the if a dose A was delivered for a certain type of tumor, here based on diagram, for example. So with the same dose is also very low, maybe somewhere close to 50%. However, if the dose B is delivered to that same tumor, the normal tissue complication goes up quite a bit, maybe 65%, 70% possibility of having 
normal tissue complication, but the control of the tumor, which is more critical, goes to pretty close to 95, 96%. So the challenge is and was and still is in field of radiation oncology that if both of these curves can be uh, separated further apart, and then the therapeutic ratio for that tumor control will go up. Uh, as you can see, if you look at delivering dose B to that same tumor, and if you are able to move the NTCB away, the tumor control will be, if you ignore the red, then you will see the tumor control is still at 97, 8%, but the complication rate will be very low at somewhere pretty close to maybe 25%. So that's the idea of uh, finding ways or methods to uh, move the or somehow spare the surrounding normal tissue so that we will have a higher uh, therapeutic ratio. Uh, the, the modalities and techniques who will deliver uh, this already before the era of IMRT, they would do better than external beam radiotherapy, of course, plus brachytherapy, internal intraoperative radiation therapy. And of course, when IMRT uh, became a reality by uh, modulating the beam and uh, knowing the uh, tracing the path of the exit dose and if it is really hitting a critical structure to block it or not hit the uh, uh, entrance dose to the critical structure, um, then we are able to really do the kinds of treatment that it was impossible to do um, just a few years ago. So uh, up to now, then we have the TCP and TCP uh, concept that are still ruling in most of the clinics. Uh, most of the physicians also were selecting radiotherapy fields and dose levels empirically um, and based largely on experience. They understood that these empirical guidelines were not accurate and didn't fully reflect the underlying anatomy, physiology, and also the dosimetry. So a few years after the availability of the 3D treatment planning, the concept of um, dose volume histogram became prevalent in early days of 3D conformal therapy, where we were able to input a 3D volume of the CT scan into the computer system and be able to see the dose distribution in every corner or every aspect of the uh, 3D volume and be able to come up with DVHs, which became a major tool uh, for uh, knowing the goodness of any plan for physicists and physicians. So, Imami also stated in his uh, uh, TCP and TCP manuscript that compilation, this. By the way, Imami's paper was nothing more than compilation of the existing data and available knowledge at the time. However, uh, Quantec uh, had a few differences, which I'm going to show you in the next slide, the difference between, between um, the Imami EPAL manuscript and the Quantec. Many similarities. But, but by the 2010, we had tons of more data from various sites around the world. And um, this was compiled with a lot more information, particularly answering some of the questions of the NTCP that was not in the paper. Here is a comparison between the two. For example, when, when uh, in 1990 that paper was published, most of the fields were being treated in parallel opposed fields and or uh, pelvic tumors were mostly treated with uh, what we used to call four field box technique. Then uh, at the time of contact, the widespread use of the 3D conformal therapy was available, even some intensively modulated radiation therapy. And often these differences resulted in highly non-uniform dose distribution in organs at risk with large volume receiving low doses. Um, 
at the time of 1990, for example, this other one, the radiation therapy, and in the single modality that we use, the spectrum of toxicity were well characterized and known. Um, but then with, at the time of Quantec, uh, many uh, curative cases receiving combined modality therapy, and then many regimens are, became very toxic, leading to problems and, and uh, with compliance, and uh, it, it was different than the previous uh, decade. Um, anyway, this uh, table came from this reference here, and just for your So by mid to late 90s, the technology of IMRT further matured. Uh, a lot of sites uh, began acquiring the needed equipment to do real IMRT, meaning be able to modulate the beam by blocking, by creating leap or block in the path of the beam where a critical structure was in, the, in that ray trace. Linux came equipped with Cone beam CT, which provided imaging, and then mostly the collimation system in accelerator head, rather than being retrofitted or rather than uh, just the cone system. The leaf is available uh, where from 1 cm down to 2.5 millimeter. And then the miniature multi leaf were also part of the machine, not necessarily again being retrofitted uh, to the head of the gantry. Compensator based IMRT also became available. Um, um, and I recall uh, that here in the U.S. call, I think the dot decimal was the name of the company that was was making uh, compensators uh, based on the CT data that you would send them, and the next day you would get a number of compensators to put in the uh, the gantry per field to create a uniform dose distribution, or however dose distribution that you needed within your target. In the treatment planning played a major role with IMRT capability and optimization. Uh, there was a number of treatment plans available. Um, uh, Monica was purchased by Electra and developed uh, Pinnacle, which used to be probably one of the older treatment planning systems. And they kept adding features to it, such as auto planning, uh, Ixlet and Ray Station. They added this MCO feature to their system, you know, originally designed by the folks at the Ray Station and their other planning system that became available, but these are mostly what I'm familiar with and they were available here in the US. In addition to these, 3D imaging capability um, uh, became a part of this whole package with image fusion packages such as MIM or Integra or Velocity that are still available and in use. Patient management, uh, record and verify system played a major in in, uh, in following the trend and not missing any part of the treatment. Moreover, having a, a documented record of what was delivered to the patient. So it made it very easy for uh, patients who were on protocol uh, for the information that the patient received. Uh, it, it, this particular item brought a significant amount of accuracy to the delivery of those to all of the clinics uh, in radiation oncology. Availability of uh, site-specific immobilization devices. Again, major thing for IMRT, as we all know, immobilization is uh, perhaps one of the bigger items in success of uh, IMRT delivery. Availability of QA devices for machine and also for patient-specific QA, and also software packages to double-check um, the MU calculations uh, for total segments per field. Companies such as Radcast, Check, and other companies uh, were created to provide those types of packages. Uh, on the top of all of these, uh, the availability of fast computers, uh, uh, good basic uh, internet and interconnectivity within hospitals, ability to integrate with all the other available critical hardware and software made uh, this whole uh, IMRT revolution a possibility. Further equipment that were available, at least uh, most of the sites in the North America had it, were the six degree of freedom table, 
uh, which is a dynamic patient support assembly with three dimensional, uh, three translational and three rotational movement. Uh, so when as cone beam CT is acquired uh, with the push of a button, uh, the patient can be moved in that direction, even if that movement had PQR and roll, then the, um, so it created a lot more accurate dose delivery right online at the time of treatment. Uh, integration of optical or video tracking system for automated positioning and movement uh, was a big thing. Uh, the companies such as OSMS is the one that is still around and they use uh, um, the camera system to look at patient surface and by allowing a threshold if a patient moves then the beam is tripped and is stopped. Uh, head and body frame for positioning and localization also plays a role in SRS and SPRT cases. And of course, the cone system continue to be available a, a bit more accurate because of our understanding of small field dosimetry. And at least here in our clinic, we use it for, we use them still for treatment of uh, trigeminal neuralgia and similar cases. Um, other advancements uh, came alongside the radiation oncology hardware, included uh, again a lot of uh, immobilization, site specific immobilization, LED camera system, vision RT, which is the same as OSMS, uh, tumor tracking using fiducials for better guidance of the cone beam CT, uh, anchor fiducials, uh, and also a uh, company variant came up with this. Uh, um, beacons that are inserted into the patient like fiducials, except they are magnets and can be detected by uh, this device called Flipso. And then the position of those uh, markers can identify exactly where the tumor is and the patient can be moved in that position. Uh, 4D imaging and gating to manage tumor movements and breathing motion particularly for cases such as the left breast and most of the abdominal tumors, that's what we use today. And uh, there was at a time uh, a vector balloon for internal immobilization of prostate, which you can see here, a 40 cc air is uh, placed inside, this is the balloon, and then kind of pushes against the posterior part of the rectal wall and immobilizes, immobilizes the prostate, which is the left uh, uh, now, 4D CT is a big deal, as you can see. For example, look at this tumor, movement of the tumor. And if you knew it wasn't because of the 4D CT, the target would have been drawn is probably a third of the what it should have been. And this is part, part of the reason that's of radiation oncology in this day of age. Um, uh, other things uh, that we use here in one was the compression belt, as uh, you can see, without the compression belt, this is the size of the target with the compression belt. Uh, there is almost 30% reduction in ITV. Again, uh, speaking of sparing the surrounding normal tissue, this is these are ways to do it. But beyond anatomy, uh, the tumor identification still needed more work or MRI. It still had great difficulty in differentiating, for example, the next issue uh, from the new tumor uh, recurrence, particularly in the brain. And numerous reports indicated that CT, for example, is inadequate in some cases also. That CT units allow functional information in the anatomical site, um, but additional details were needed and, and molecular imaging is, um, is coming along and has come a long way and is becoming a part of human uh, elimination as well as identification in many of the sites. Then the situation with IMRT obviously is movement of the leaf and changing the dose to the area that is delineated. 
And as you can see, this uh, uh, non-uniform fluent paints the radiation into the target. And if you have, let's say with the static IMRT, if you have, depending on the number of fields that you have, um, the dose can be painted to the target and um, um, we get better control of the organs at risk and a more ideal dose distribution within the target. I mean, the advantage of IMRT, if one can say in one word or one statement, is it will provide better uh, sparing of the surrounding normal tissue because you can block the surrounding normal tissue if it is in the path of the beam, in whether it's entrance or exit. So coming along the era of the SARP, stereotactic um, ablation radiation therapy. Um, so all of these advancements and technology really led us to do SARP. Um, uh, and SARP became um, more popular and accepted in, in many of the sites. And um, this is mostly outside of the um, brain in body parts, it's like a stereotactic body radiotherapy. So the fact that with modern uh, radiation therapy technique, multiple beams are used and result in usually a non-uniform dose distribution, it necessitates the treatment planner uh, to get information to predict the risk to the normal tissue injury uh, for computing the 3D dose distribution um, such that the therapeutic ratio can be optimized. And one of the goals of Quantec was to summarize the available 3D dose volume outcome data available for uh, all of the sites. And we've been using that information uh, since about a decade ago. Stereotactic ablative radiotherapy rapidly became a modality of choice. Um, and of course, this SARP cover under it SRS or SBRP. The features of SARP obviously are much higher dose per fraction and a smaller number of fractions, and often hypofractionation. Um, it has brought about impressive clinical efficacy, which is much larger than what was expected in a linear quadratic model and the old uh, four R's of radiobiology, which really seems to no longer be suitable to explain SARP. And as you all know, the fifth R of radiobiology emphasizes the intrinsic radiosensitivity of tumor cells, which may justify the response we get. SARP. This is a page of um, AAPM report TG101, uh, which really talks about the conventional radiation therapy versus SBRT. And as you can see, it kind of gives information and uh, in what the conventional RT does versus the SBRT. So in all of these, a major challenge, which I really didn't have time to go into, is the field has become smaller. When you have IMRT, you may have to deliver a ton of dose through a very tiny field uh, that may not even have electronic equilibrium within it. So small field dosimeter is a big deal. And um, there is a TG report 155 that uh, shows a lot of information on small field symmetry. The graph that I'm showing here uh, shows Monte Carlo simulation versus various chambers, uh, such as diamond, even diodes, and films, and so forth, other chambers. And uh, this is those to water. And you can see a factor of more than two different in output calibration is observed in some of these chambers. So one has to be, when you do IMRT, one has to be very careful to look into this condition of a small field of symmetry um, and uh, make proper make. Another item that I want to quickly 
touch upon is uh, the concept of uh, single IC center, multiple targets within the brain. As you can see, look how many targets are in here. We have treated up to 18 tiny lesions in the brain, where in the past, just a, just a few years ago, we used to treat the whole brain. And now that is no longer an option. Um, because the technology is available to do VMAT and IMRT and treat these tiny lesions and yet have reasonable integral dose uh, within the brain. Let me see, I had a video here. I don't know if I can make it run. There we go. So as you can see, the MLC moves around and um, delivers the dose to each one of those targets as uh, needed. Here's the, a comparison between uh, let's say clinical gammonite, which is a $6 million machine compared to using, for example, an EDGE or a Linux with uh, high depth MLC. As you can see here, the data shows this is clinical gammonite um, beam time um, in minutes. So you save a lot of time delivering this um, multi target single IC center uh, with a Linux, and the dose distribution is fairly similar to that of gamma. And the <coughs> purple here shows the 500 centigrade ISO surface line, which is covering parts of the brain, but the uh, prescription dose, which is much higher, is uh, delivered to the brain. This graph shows uh, the brain volume at 50 gray, here shows at 10 gray and at 12 gray. Again, uh, the single SRS plan versus IMRS. And again, you can see that this technique is a very doable technique and has become a certain a modality or um, favored modality for many of the sites in the US. <laughs> if the next year is I will show you the magic of SPRT. Quickly go through the slides as you can see the 10 grade times 5 fraction. Here's the SPRT of the lung net, and it came from, from the primary colorectal cancer three months later. Tumor's gone, tumor's here. Uh, here's another one the uh, poro based uh, SPLT, 10 grade times 5 fractions. Again, tumor's here, tumor's gone. From the primary lung cancer. Same thing here. Again, three months later, non small cell lung cancer, 10 grade times five. You see, it was gone. But yes, yeah, I'm just showing you this to, to let you know that this technology, this technique works. Look at the tumor here, gone three months later. What about liver? All of this tumor, this is heart, of course, this is a lesion, gone. And um, metastatic lesion in the liver. Three months, 12 grade times five fractions. I mean, look at this liver lesion, gone. Professor Parsai, your time is nearly over. You mm -hmm. have still 20 oh. slides. Mm -hmm. And these are metastatic from breast cancer. Why don't I and stop here? Uh, you can. Uh, Go ahead for five more minutes to complete okay. your presentation. Let me, stop like. here. Let me quickly go over these. Just, these are just showing some. Uh, you must say the 20 grade times one, one fraction. This lesion again. Yeah. Um, um, again. This lesion disappeared here after three months. I didn't put that here, but it is also, I think, after six months, I'm sorry, later. Three months after SPRT to a painful hit. You can see that here. And it's gone. Look at the dose distribution and the dose follow up. Beautiful, really. This is 50 year old uh, uh, with metastatic for pancreatic cancer, 18 grade times three every other day. Very nice dose distribution. Beautiful and uh, 
is working another SBRT to a primary lung cancer abutting the heart. As you can see, the dose uh, carved around the heart is beautiful. Here's another three month post SBRT for earlier stage small cell cancer of lung. You can see here the tumor and then gone. So this is all I have. Uh, I appreciate your attention and thank you very much. I will be listening to your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Parsai, for your excellent talk and presentation. You summarize radiotherapy history and current advanced methods in use. Uh, there was not a specific question. Uh, uh, I had only one feedback that uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, attendants uh, asked that. I'm losing your voice, uh, Dr. Mazarani. Professor Hossein, are you there? I think uh, some internet. Uh, about that. Yeah. So uh, there was a question on how much about machine tolerance for new technique. There's a question one. Oh, machine tolerance. The, yeah. uh, the machine tolerance is typically in uh, North America, we use <coughs> task group report 142, which has, <clears throat> which has machine tolerance defined for IMRT, <coughs> excuse me, SRS and SVRT techniques. Um, so that usually gets applied and that gets reviewed by a state in which you are in. At, through, for example, in Ohio, Ohio Department of Health comes and reviews those types of things. But they are typically uh, in delivery, those, uh, for example, in any of the SRS and SVRT, we are looking at sub millimeter accuracy. Okay. okay. And there is another question is uh, about uh, the uh, gap chromic, radiochromic film patient specific. Uh, can it be used as uh, for quality assurance? Of course. We used to use gap chromic until these um, fancy machines were available to us, uh, like arc check or diode arrays. And now we have changed to a digital because it's just more convenient, but films can be used for. Uh, patient-specific quality assurance. Okay. And then regarding the development of the radiotherapy technology, uh, stepwise, he has asked to say that uh, from 3D to conformal to VMAT to IGRT, uh, it should be, uh, you should go uh, in steps. <laughs> That's one of the session. I think uh, for want of time, we'll not go for more questions. Uh, I'm uh, able to see Professor Hossein again here. Uh, so can, yes, can you... Uh, yeah, you can carry on the next uh, speaker. Can you introduce, please? Yes. Uh, uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mohammadi. Do you have my screen? Yes, screen, but yes. That, uh, the specific slide of the CV you have to show. Yes, I shared the... The entire screen is coming. That uh, second uh, slide you have to press on that. And the things... Uh, do you, okay, now do you have it now? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Mohammadi. I'm glad to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Mohammadi is a studied uh, BSc, MSc uh, uh, in Iran and uh, PhD in medical physics, as if his PhD in medical physics from Adelaide University, Australia. Uh, is accredited uh, uh, radiotherapy equipment commissioning and quality assurance Australia uh, Australian College of Physical Scientists and uh, Educational Medicine is uh, registered as a qualified medical physics specialist in radiation oncology medical physics Australian College of Physics and Medicine uh, Prof. Dr. Mohammed is assistant professor uh, in Hamadan University of Medical Sciences. 
consultant uh, medical physicist, several radiotherapy and oncology centers in Iran, senior medical physicist, Royal Adelaide Hospital, Adelaide, South Australia. He is affiliate senior lecturer, medical physics course coordinator of the Adelaide University. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Mohammadi published two books, published uh, over 64 papers, presented over nine, 193 abstracts in meetings and conferences. Uh, he received eight approved fully grant projects. Uh, he graduated 32 postgraduate students, MSc and PhD. Uh, Dr. Mohammadi is the Israel board member of International Journal of Radiation Research, associate editor for physic physical and engineering sciences in medicine, chairing about 22 workshops on radiation oncology physics, scientific committee member at 24 national international conferences, uh, chairing four national meetings. He is uh, affiliated uh, member of Iranian Association of Medical Physics, member of the Institute, uh, Institute for Photonics and Advanced Sensing, registered supervisor as the principal supervisor, the University, uh, University of Adelaide for PhD and MSc degree in the School of Physical Sciences, uh, Adelaide University. Dr. Mohammadi. Please start your talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your kind and extensive introduction. Thanks a lot for to Professor Aaron for and Dr. Jean actually for organizing this wonderful meeting and Dr. Muzdarani for inviting me. And actually, I want to say my greeting all participants, mostly coming from Iran and I miss them because of COVID situation and I have not been there for a while. Okay. Starting. Yeah, we are able to see your screen. Okay, do you see that? Fine. Yeah, exactly, fine. Okay, the title of my talk is impact of the use of axillary devices on the quality of radiation therapy. This talk mostly covers it briefly talks about the quality of the radiation therapy, then concentrates mostly on the patient setup and immobilization approaches for different, for, uh, different tools and apparatus used for immobilization and approaches for target localization from CT to other devices used. Well, starting with the quality of radiotherapy. As you know, quality is just a concept and is not really easy to measure. And in, as a scientific approach for radiotherapy quality assessment, we need to convert the quality concept into the values. And it's not really easy to discuss easily if we don't convert it into values because it just let me arrange my time. And because quantity we can compare, we can say what does it mean 19 is larger than for example 17, but you can say that the my treatment quality is better than yours and there's no excuse to accept or reject. So we need to define some parameters to as quality indicators, and then we can we have to score them, scoring as assessment, and then we can improve the scoring. And finally, we can measure and we can compare. Sinoni from Italy 2007, they published a paper about the treatment indicator in radiation therapy and they introduced some treatment indicator that you can see in the left column, starting with instrumentation, multidisciplinary approach, survey of patient opinion, and for clinical 
aspect treatment planning, number of fields, shaped field, and portal verifications included. And following with clinical record quality, workload, waiting times, and use of high energy machines are nominated as a parameters to convert the quality of treatment to quantity. So after a while, they find that it's not really easy because of changing of technology and concept. We can't rely to that topics and to nominators and the indicators, and they have to be changed. And at the moment, we can change it. Now we can see that, for example, for instrumentation, we can see that, or we can say, comprehensive quality assurance program for instrumentation can be substituted with instrumentation. Multidisciplinary approach, however, is not changed, but in concept and in depth, it's changed because most of the, most of disciplinaries are involved, including medical physics contribution with the job is extensively uh, changed. And instead of survey of patient opinion and consent of the treatment, now internal review or external audit can be replaced because they have better idea in depth about the techniques or delivery techniques. Uh, for clinical aspect, you can see that we can, instead of having treatment planning system, we can go further and we can substitute those constraints and advanced planning instead. And advanced technique preferences, imaging, imaging, gating, double check, and lots of other things pending on the ratio and the quality of treatment you are desiring to install and implant in your department. And instead of clinical record quality documentation and follow-up protocolizing of the department, it can be one of the issues that we can just categorize here. Instead of workshop means that differentiated workload or expert with or the particular workload because of use of expert team instead of just, for example, non-expert people and workload ratio per treatment instead of having just few stuff in the department. And waiting time is not changed because lots of issues against one, but we can just think about it. Other things like gaps happens during the treatment. And about the high energy units, just comprehensive modalities can be substituted. Okay, but the quality assurance means that we discussed with quality assurance program and we didn't discuss about the definition. All procedure, we can say about the quality assurance, all procedure ensure consistency of medical prescription and safe and secure fulfillment of the prescription. Two, deliver the dose to target volume. Two, reduce or minimize the dose to normal tissues and maximize or, min or maximize the protection for personnel or minimize the exposure for others with adequate patient monitoring. In the other words, QA in RT is concerned with all aspects of the radiotropy procedure should involve all groups and stuff in a collaborative approach. Okay. Quality assurance reduces uncertainty and errors in radiotropy in terms of controlling of the dosimetry procedure, treatment planning procedure, equipment performance, treatment delivery, potential, all potential procedures, and everything can be involved in the cycle of the treatment starting from documentation, staging, up to follow-up. In the other words, quality assurance means the reduction of the chance of any incident and accident and errors occurring at the department and or increasing the chance of incident and error recognition before happening and reducing the unpredicted consequencing 
for treatment, treat, uh, for patient treatment, that mostly just you can see that in TG100 or TG279. And the question starts here, that comprehensive plan of most of equipment and procedure are developed and documented. Minus section of the pad or treatment pad is not included appropriately, like patient setup, immobilization device, and target localization procedure, because lots of changes day by day, technique by technique, and this also should be just nominated as a part of the cycle of treatment. Okay, starting with the patient setup and immobilizing. And you can see here, let's try to take this one out. I don't see that. And uh, yeah, you can see that the justification, what we have, no, no. And easily we can say that as introduction that the RT aims accurate amount of dose to the accurate location means that value of the dose to the exact location are desired or planned. If we change the location, we have two big issue, recurrency of tumor and the chance of radiation induced secondary cancer means that if it for location or accurate location, two different and significant problem will be occurred. And that needs more consideration. Irradiation is supposed to be conformal, reproducible, and highest technical performance. And in this case of plan to be, we have to make a plan to ensure that patient positioning is stable and reproducible. And what we can do from classical point of view, patient is only allowed to breathe normally and all the section must or should be fixed. But modern view says that all potential motion affecting the dose delivery should be monitored and controlled. And producible, pro reproducible immobilization allows for reduction of margin around the target and minimizing the actually minimizing the high dose delivered to the healthy tissues. Immobilization, in the other words, we can say is one of the important sections comes from accurate location, means that it can be nominated as a heart of radiotherapy. And this section is going to, say, to focus on the crucial step of treatment and delivery. Hmm. What happened? Okay. In contrast to the chain reaction or consequent effect, here we have some dilemma because the dose can be delivered in must or should be delivered in different sessions. It's not easy to say that which one is preferred to another. Means that, for example, with different concepts affecting each other significantly. To minimize high dose delivery to healthy tissue is the meaning of the reproducible immobilization. Immobilization, uh, reproducibility of the immobilization means the allowing for reduction of the margin. And one of the crucial concepts for the quality of treatment is margin and margination or shorting, shortening of the margin means good achievement of radiotherapy. As background, you can say that 60 and 70s cobalt machines and mega voltage X-ray machines, they were using skin marker localizing by, and the aid, with the aid of uh, lining laser to set up the patient. And finally, or in just very good condition, just into the better condition, KV imager were used using film to verify patient positioning. However, we had no image registration and just comparison was a film to film. It wasn't easy and result at the moment is not acceptable. 
1980s, with the big issue and the development of the city and introducing of the city and the 3D planning, the planning section jumped to three-dimensional achievement. However, in contrast for delivery, still it was two-dimensional because of immobilization. We had nothing for immobilization comparable with city development and means that it was a crucial issue still 90, mid 90s, immobilization are introduced, different immobilization started to develop and introduce to the departments. And then the short margin have led to the advanced mobilizing and in contrast on the cycle, shorter margin made better and advanced immobilizing. Okay, the principle of patient setup is to ensure that the patient is positioned in convenient condition, comfortable situation, and in a repeatable position to minimize the intra and interfraction positioning. It's important at the moment, even now, is the challenging interfraction position verification or variation. The monitoring is challenging issue and is not really easy to cover. Okay, starting with the frame as one of the immobilized devices used mostly for CNS systems and supine position mostly frame and without with frame and frameless studies start for head and neck for cervical and thoracic spinal regions and frame base, as you see here, for head and neck and for thoracic area and for pelvic area can be used in the for especially for hypofractionated radiotropy to reduce the number of fractions and to improve the margins. And before IG, before IGRT, the main issue is that the frame was just giving us some outer coordinate, outer coordinate, then we could, we could say that is related on this is associated with the situation of the internal situation, internal area that we need, or GTV or PTV. But after IGRT, they found that maybe is not correct and is just starting giving the coordinator and translating the coordinator to the machine. And suppose that the supposed around five millimeter margin for PTV at that time. And after using the stereotypic body frame and comes from different companies and vendors, they improve the margin and reduction, the margin reduction, as you see here, 3.9, 2.2 and 3.5 millimeter in different direction based on the paper published. And more investigation happened for uh, frames and the use of different frames are introduced and CT compatible images and frames, MR compatible frames and Heidelberg frame and Electa spear frame, all of them they use, and you can see here results is better than previous one in mind from, I don't see that actually the result because some section I can't see. Okay, now it's better. I bring this one down. Okay. And here you can see that there, for example, SPF fixation or invasive infection frames for spine, for liver, lung, and abdomen, and bony markers, bony areas. The highest margin and setup error, because margin is correlated strongly with setup error, is less than four millimeter. It's a really great achievement compared to others that say that it was around 10 millimeter before. And for masks, head and neck tumor typically do not move and significantly easily we can immobilize using a thermoblast masks. But at the moment they have found that because of changing of the, in the rotation and some misalignment may change the results and 
uh, shoulder immobilization should be also included. And you can see that the setup error with new developed thermoblasts from 1.3 millimeter or just sub-millimeter standard deviation is if you learn is introduced and is really great achievement. Here we have some more details about the actually about the frames, I'm sorry, about the uh, masks. And you can see that introduced with different vendors and a verified position by CBCT during the treatment and the maximum uh, inconsistency is around, is around 32 millimeter. And the second thing is that the, for immobilization is the supine, I'm uh, sorry, for boards, breastboard use here. I have some issue with my the section and I have to move it from this side to another to see the to see my slides. And for boards used for breast treatment, you have two different types of the bow carbon based or fiber carbon based and foam based. And usually breast boards are used for while arm raised over the head and the head is turned toward the contralateral lateral breast. And in the prone, as you see that the prone in prone is not is much like potential is, it seems to be convenient. And those for heart and lung is reducing. And the supine position, finally, I say I can say that there's more reproducibility for supine position because an easier setup and breast holding system can be used in this case as well. These are results for two different techniques used for press for breast use in press prone and supine. And you can see here uh, for uh, what happened here is 12.8 the maximum here and 11.9 and 24.3 millimeter and here the result is much better for prone cases compared to uh supine okay for thorax and abdominal region you can see that you can use some all the immobilizing devices like base and rest, foot rest and head rest, and, and beds actually, and immobilize the thermoplast immobilizing are giving better results. And we can see that the patient can be actually just positioned better and in the safe and reproducible condition. And if we don't use the appropriate immobilizer, day-to-day -day reprodu reproducibility is around 10 millimeter. But with the devices introduced for the thorax and abdominal region cancer treatment, like alpha cradle expanded foam and MACVAC and thermoplast immobilization system, Positioning accuracy can be in order of three millimeter and seven millimeter margin reduction can be achieved in this case. For breast IMRT, again, we can use the thermoblast immobilizer to reduce the margins and reduce the positioning of the patient during the treatment because of image and breathing issues. Okay about the vacuum mattress or backpacks or cushions, usually used for thorax cases or abdominal cases. And, and this can be done easily, even you can do some section of setup outside the room and transfer the patient if required. However, again, transition to the couch is not really easy. But just in some cases, when the patient immobilizes, in my patient has got some issues like paralyzing, etc., can be used before. And backpacks are able to control rotational errors. 
significantly, as you see here, is the sub-millimeter reproducibility and is really great achievement compared to previous studies. And all the studies are, are have used are listed below and you can use it. And if there's any question, again, we can discuss about it later. And for spine SPRT3 mobilization devices are compared for 84 patients and results, you can see that it around the margin can be within two millimeter. Well, the vacuum matrix is an alternative to use the long spine. Again, I have to just, okay, now better. Okay, to use a long spine board, advantage comfortability and comfort being adaptable to all cases. The patient is more easily positioned and pressure can be distributed to whole body surfaces and not the stress is lower. This advantage is a fragile and it's not really easy to use every time because of changing of the, if the changes of pressure and vacuum can be tested during the treatment. And some of them like puncture happens and the vacuum can be vanished. Increasing, increasing the treatment cost and more time is required and the whole procedure should be more complicated compared to previous techniques. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next issue is this, after that, the just surface immobilizer or the patient immobilizer, we have some issues with moving target volumes, how we can control this one. Advanced treatment of thorax or abdomen tumors hold a high risk of the geographical or geometric miss compared to conventional fractionation because of the using of, <coughs> excuse me, because of the use of tidal margin. And in mobile tumors or moving tumors, Baseline shifts independent of the bony anatomy, and this should be considered. And it's not really easy to use frames or immobilizer or thermoplastics. Thermoplastics, they, they not work. They are not working very well, and they will be uh, just affected by breathing uh, and beating hard and swallowing, etc. And in another order of the movement, we can say edema, bladder and rectal feeling means the interfractions, interfraction compared to interfraction, the first ones, and muscle tension, especially prone to target volume on for lung and liver. And the third one is the abdominal compression, and you can see here in the image, and especially for some target, they are moving significantly during in during the treatment or during the dose delivery or intra fraction variation. Some things should be controlled, and abdominal pressure should be applied in this case. And they are uncomfortable like thermoblast masks, and they should be this should be considered. But again, is available and. It affect imaging and imaging, for example, anterior image doesn't work in this case and probably more imaging is required. Okay, about the limitation of immobilization we discussed so far, all of immobilization devices introduced up to now, they have some set of limitation, accuracy, feasibility, and comfort for patient. Friends hold intrinsic systemic error and they may affect or introduce infection and discomfort and pain. Musks, and they, are, they, they need to, uh, time is required to make a move and they are most of time are comfort, uncomfortable and abdominal compression also should be some issue. 
and it should be the same, should have the same issue with like the, the masks. For moving targets, immobilization need to be and means that the surface immobilizer are not working very well and we need to introduce all the local for all the all the techniques and all the things to control such as facial seed laser and fluoroscopy imaging during the treatment. In summary, we can say that the risk and benefit need to be weighted and to find that or compromise which one is the better to be used or not to be used. And the future of immobilizer, in future, as you know, because of development of IGRT techniques, immobilization techniques and tools play minor but important roles. The exact positioning of moving tumor strongly comes, strongly depends on the, can be controlled and monitored with tumor tracking techniques at the moment, and they can be replaced with the current techniques. Nanotechnology is another approach to detect tumor margin, and then we can go for safer margin instead of having bigger margin and uh, or CTV comparing to the conventional margination. And introducing of six degree of freedom in rotational and translational movement, the movement and changing of the location of the PTV through IGRT would be much easier. This comes from the coach, six degree of freedom, pinch, pitch roll and motion and translation, transitional movement to the couch control all comes from the robotic arms easily can be done and machine and computational system can control the position even intrafraction. Okay, as a summary, you can say that the accuracy of the delivery strongly depends on the accuracy of the device. And consequently, accuracy of the po patient positioning and target localization relies and strongly depends on the accuracy of the imaging system and the devices used. And how we can be sure that the device and imaging systems are working very well. Introducing a quality assurance program, fully monitoring of the whole procedure of the treatment. QAP or quality assurance program should include all devices and procedure. And what set up error at the moment we are countered with the set of positioning and immobilizing devices, for example, for boards, you can see that the boards and belly boards and breast boards, beam attenuation, beam quality change, cracks, damages, leakages, changing of the attenuation factor after a while and because of the irradiation, coverage and angles, all of them can be should be monitored and should be included as a part of quality assurance program for both. Fixators and max attenuation, surface dose enhancement, position accuracy, and changing of the size during the treatment. Vacuum bag, just the patient weight, lose and gain, vacuum check, and head and foot rest. You can see the flexibility changing of the shape because of irradiation and attenuation should be taken into account. Okay, take a breath. We're going for the next section is the target localization starting with CT simulator. I'm not going to explain that most of you know what the CT is and how it works, but it just you can concentrate on the different difference between CT scanner and CT simulator. Three major difference comes with the bore, internal and external localizing lasers and patient support table to mimic the treatment table. 
And procedure is clear, patient aligning the treatment position, immobilization will be applied, laser origin mark, and CT image is acquired, and isostenter optionally can be marked or not, and patient set of instruction must be recorded. What sort of test is required based on the TG668PM report? You can see that from radiation safety, radiation dosimetry, laser tabletop, and imaging section, lots of issues should be controlled, including CT number, accuracy, and field uniformity, electron density to CT conversion, and some engineering job, including peak potential and half value layer of beam energy, MAS or MR, or current linearity and reproducibility. Several tests are listed in TKG 66, and you can see that the frequency can be from daily to monthly and annually, and tolerances are really good. However, at the moment, I think after around, I think 2006, after 15 years or 16 years, uh, we need better and tighter margin of tolerances compared to, and for us it's better than uh, we have our local tolerance instead of relying to TG66. And more tests is required for imaging section. And, but for imaging, we are not just using CT images for planning. Some section of images through the plan can be used as a beam eye view, as Dr. Parsa mentioned, or room eye view, and, or digitally reconstructed images in physical concept to be compared with image projection images acquired during treatment and you can compare. This is a comparison of the KV image and the MV image and poor contrast just leads us to rely to bony markers instead of the tumor area. This is a comparison of diagnostic KV CT and a reconstructed MVCT, MV Kumbim CT uh, acquired in treatment room by EPID and comparable. And in some section, you can see the poor contrast, but good thing is as advantage of MVCT, you can see that metal artifact is gone and you don't need to use any metal artifact reduction algorithm to the image. Second thing is that 3D MV imaging or MVCT or, or, or KVCT. Here, diagnostic fan beam KVCT comparable with the KV cone beam CT. And images should be the same. However, you, we have to know, we have to remind that the image reconstruction algorithms are not the same because of the different approach and FTK algorithm is different from fan beam or radon transform section and uh, algorithms. And this should be, especially in peripheral area, this difference should be taken into account. More testers, geometric testers, imaging testers, and some extra testers. Then we have different and three different section of imaging or uh, imaging devices actually tests in the room, including geometry one depends, depends on the technique that you need and tolerances. There are lots of tests you should do or physicists have to do. And imaging panel calibration as imaging section should be there, it should be checked and should be compared. We usually do the image calibration in a monthly basis and panel shift if you are thinking about the large field of view. Some tests recommended for 2D planner imaging and 3D imaging section because of software is included and some in some section they are different, including mechanical and safety and imaging control. And here you can see that how we can do that just easily as a daily check using a cube. Cube test easily, you can do that with one image. 
KV or NV image can be compared with the reference one. And you can find the isocenter and imaging isocenter, if it isocenter should be matched with machine or linear accelerator isocenters, means that the mechanical isocenters and the dosimetric isocenters. When we are talking about isocenter, isocenter is not the just one point is just the accumulation of many points. Each beam has got its own isocenter. Gantry, collimator, and couch, they have got their own isocenter. EPID, an onboard imager, including KV detector, a KV panel, and KV uh, source, all of them have got their own isocenter, and all of them must be matched. And other things that usually we use as extra and Calypso and Ray Pilot system, three electromagnetic correspond transponder can be implanted in the patient and the positioning with different uh, radio frequency waves and the uh, position can be monitored during the treatment. This is a very good uh, technique on device to control the interfraction motion. And the setup error can be reduced up to 3.2 millimeter. And the good achievement is comparable with the solid tumors. Other devices like extract, align RT, or vision RT, and catalyst or CRAT, we can see that they can be used to make some images, surface images, and the surface images can be compared with reference surface images collected at the first of treatment, first day of the treatment as a reference images, and then can be compared. And if there is any issue, need to, more, to have more investigation. Uh, and limitation. Uh, yeah. Time constraint. Can you just uh, speed up because one more lecture will be there. Yeah, sure. At the moment, I have around four minutes, and I am just I will just okay. manage in four minutes time. Okay. Limitation is surface motion tracking. They should be entirely. They may not be correlated with internal target. There are three papers I have included here for each of these devices. Here I was because of lack of time, I'm not able to discuss in depth, in depth about them. And ultrasonic imager can be used for EBRT cases and mostly for BRCA cases. And limitation, you can see that the poor resolution, partial and limited view and limited penetration, but can be used easily because of non-ionizing radiation. Those and sometimes it's very good the option. More references for image uh, or for localized target localization system quality assurance. And finally, okay, a summary I have just one slide says that accuracy of the delivery strongly depends on the accuracy of the devices used in the whole procedure of the radiotropic treatment. The accuracy of patient positioning and target localization is a part of accuracy of the delivery and should be included in the QA plan. Accuracy of device and imaging system should also be taken into account comprehensively. Monitoring of tools and devices performance through a quality assurance program. And I just reminding that quality assurance plan means that no major deviation from the plan that we are aiming to do in the department for treatment. And QA test for some of immobilizing devices and new target localization devices are not sufficient and more consideration is required to list the potential test for the device. That's all. And I think that I finished on time. Okay. Thank yes. you very much for your listening. Thank and if there's you. any question, please share. Thank you very me. much, Dr. Mohammadi. Okay. Excellent. For your excellent talk and presentation.
presentation. I don't see any question, but uh, there are some requests for your presentation, your PowerPoints. If it's My pleasure. possible, I can share them. it. Uh, and actually, because of lack of time, I just summarized. It was around 70 slides, and I just reduced to 50 okay, because of you. time. Mm -hmm. And I will give you the comprehensive one as well if you're quiet. Thank you. I mean, the next. Uh, again, I think we have lost uh, Professor Hossein. Um, uh, you Professor Shugulmai, continue. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Introduce, please. I mean, and then uh, Mohammed has to unshare, I think. Uh, don't you have oh, my. Uh, okay. May, may I continue? Anything. Sure. Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Mamadi, could you please unshare your screen? Because I, I cannot share it. Okay, now you are now. Okay. Yeah, it's yours. Now you can share your slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's great. He's great. Yeah. yeah, we're getting it. Uh, do you see my slides? Yeah, now yes. Do you have my slides? I yeah, can. we are able to see it. Introduce, uh, uh, yeah, I mean. Yes. Our last speaker, Dr. Mam. But I mean, mostly she does it. Uh, uh, Dr. President of Iranian Association of Medical Physicists. He is head of radiotherapy physics unit in Shiraz University of Medical Sciences, of radio oncology, medical physics, and radiology technology, ionizing radiation protection research center, found member medical imaging research center uh, in Shiraz University of Medical Sciences. Uh, Dr. Mosle is uh, a member of National Examination Board of Medical Physics and Radiology and a uh, member of National Reading Committee. BSc PM Hyatt training radiotherapy physics from UK. Uh, he's a registered uh, Physics from college. Yeah, I think there's an internet instability. Uh, different places, Royal Marston Hospital. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do think you hear uh, me? Yeah, yeah, we hear you. We hear you. Yes. Uh, so I think uh, okay. Amin can start his okay. talk. I think. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Mosley has radiotherapy physics experience. Is, uh, he has uh, over 110 journal papers and over uh, 1,800 scientific journals for medical physics. Uh, had some few words before in case words. Uh, um, hey. most, uh, please. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you will be speaking, right? Yes, yes. 
Yeah, good. You Thank can you share. So and yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the introduction, uh, Professor Mosdarani, I thank you for also for inviting me to take part in this uh, uh, webinar, A Farm School. Uh, in turn, I'd like, I'd like to uh, thank Professor Arun and his colleagues at the A Farm for organizing uh, these uh, these meetings and uh, giving us this opportunity. And of course. I would like to thank all the participants, uh, the large number of participants who've turned up and uh, taken part in, to, in this uh, meeting. Um, I'll record my talk and it will be presented. It's uh, a brief introduction really of a really large uh, topic. I'll be happy to share the slides uh, if required. And also I would be happy to answer questions after. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. If uh, Professor Aaron could uh, share the clip, please. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> In the meantime, I'd like to ask uh, the participants to mute their audio, please, because it's a interface with the presentation. I think you have to unmute. Okay. Uh, okay. Are it, is it audible to you? Hello? I mean? Uh, no, it isn't yet. Okay. Just what I will try to do again to just from these things. Okay. I think this is this is uh, you are uh, uh, you are uh, pointing on that. It's okay now. Now we are getting. Yes. 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 Yeah. That's it. Shiraz University of Medical Sciences. I'd like to thank the K Farm Management uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to. Your uh, screen is not. I have uh, no conflicts of interest to declare. The end of this presentation will be to briefly introduce some of you. Professor the Arun, please share the screen. Emphasizing the yeah, physical there. aspects and concentrating on those. And the take home messages will be that modern bracket therapy is not yet high tech. Aaron, it's just not it's uh, sharing the. Uh, the, the video player it needs to be shared. You have your desktop, player. but not uh, the therapy. Are you not able to see this presentation? Uh, that. And then no. Turn, uh, we have your uh, desktop, your but not the uh, presentation. Images, applications, to the planning and those calculations. So I have to again go to his. Uh, I think you need to 
share the uh, that application, the the Windows Media Player application, whichever player you have. No, what you have shared me is this MP4 file only. Yeah, yes. you, you could please could you share that application? Yeah, MP4 file only I'm sharing. So there will be voice only, no sli uh, slides and things. Can you share from your side and start talk? That is much better, I think. I mean, yeah, I see if I can share it from there. Shared with me is MP4, not the uh, file which was actually video. It was just the talk. Well, it, it wouldn't be any use, would it? Um, it? If you could, you know, when you share, it asks you what you want to share. You would, you could share uh, the, not the screen, but the application. That is what I'm trying to do. That is what you have got is a MP4 file. No, I mean in Zoom when you say share. Uh, yeah, I think there's a choice to uh, share the application as opposed to the screen. I think it's better you go through your slides. Yeah. See, when I come here, it is not coming. What I mean is if you uh, unshare the screen, please, Professor Aaron, and yeah, then share, go, go to share again, and yeah. you ask what you want to share. In that case, say uh, the MP player, whichever, the, the Windows Media Player, whichever you have, whichever is open. You need to have it open, though, first. Could you? Could you first open it? Play it? Are you? Hello, my name is Amir. Yeah, I did I'm that. I'm a medical physicist from Okay, so now you should uh, yeah, go into my school and say, I do have a pay for management uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to uh, advances in the physical aspects of the brachytherapy. I have uh, no conflicts of interest to declare. Dr. Mosley, you can uh, briefly introduce some of the You can play the file yourself. Size of the physical uh, aspects. Yes, I could, if I can share it. Uh, the I, I, I'll try from here. I'll try from here. If not, then I'll just do it high tech. Give the talk again, my Okay. You get it now? I'll start by no. Uh, no. If you could, uh, uh, Sarah, could you unshare and then let me see if I can share it from here. And if it's any good. Yeah. Now you can? Hello, my name is. Ah, I mean? Yes. Now you can share your uh, PPT, I think, because what you have said, sent is uh, actually just voice. Not, yes. Not a video. Okay. Let me, let me share this now. Can you see the screen? Yeah. 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 Okay. Hello, my name is I'll start by 
we don't have your slides. Yeah, that's some problem. Yes. That is what I asked for. At least I could have got the PPTs from him. I could have shown the people spoken. Yep. Okay, we have no, your we have slide, Dr. Mosle. Yeah. You have to play, no? No vice. I mean, we are not getting your voice. Yes. Uh, I think the file size is too large. That cannot be shared properly. Uh, maybe it's better to share the slides only and put uh, the voice or explain the slides one by one. I mean, you have to unmute. Okay. Uh, uh, we'll just go through it from here. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Now you have to play. So we, we have your slides. Yeah, yes, slide. we have your slides. Okay. okay. And uh, can you hear me properly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. So I will start uh, by saying the title uh, Advances in the Physical Aspects of Racket Therapy, as uh, I'm Amin Mosley, and I'm from Shiraz, Iran. I will give a, a brief overview. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. And uh, what I'm aiming in this presentation is to briefly uh, introduce some of the developments in the field of brachytherapy. Very brief, it's a huge field. Uh, I concentrate on some of the physical aspects and my take home messages will be that modern brachytherapy is indeed high tech, uh, opposite to what uh, many people may think, and that it is uh, continuously improving. Um, so what I'll ask uh, uh, why we might concentrate on brachytherapy, go through some of the developments in brachytherapy sources, after loading units, use of images, applicators, treatment planning, and uh, dose calculation. So why brachytherapy at all? Uh, well, hallmarks of brachytherapy are that the high dose is very conformal, it has adaptive radiotherapy inherent in it, and there are strong favorable uh, clinical evidence uh, for, for, uh, for brachytherapy. So these are the sort of things that might say in the 21st century, we talk about advanced external beam radiotherapy techniques like uh, VMAT, et cetera. Uh, some examples uh, for people who might want, would like to uh, read more about this, uh, the reasoning and the rationale for brachytherapy, these two papers from 2020 and 2021, uh, for example, I suggest. Well, right, R let's move on to uh, brachytherapy sources. Of course, they were all, to begin with, radium-226 uh, tubes, uh, interstitial needles, etc. And then other sources came, and most of them were man-made. 
Um, here's a table summarizing them, comparing them with radium-226 uh, in terms of half-life emission type. Of course, we mostly want gamma, a mean energy, and uh, in, in the setting, low dose rate, high dose rate, whatever, uh, and the uses are here uh, summarized. Sources come in various shapes and sizes, uh, as seen in this ICRU report. Um, um, tubes, needles, wires, ribbons, etc. Nowadays, in the HDR setting, we talk about stepping source in, most, in HDR units. Uh, here's an example of a seed, a radioactive seed, such as an iodine 125. Uh, for a permanent insertion in the prostate uh, under ultrasound guidance and inserted in a regular pattern. So most common uh, sources have been iridium-192, iodine-125, cobalt-60, etc. Right. Um, here is an, an interesting comparison. Uh, cobalt 60 for many developing countries has advantages of the longer half life and the no need to uh, replace the source every four months or so, uh, like iridium. Uh, so uh, that was of interest. And the, the units that came, of course, were quite uh, useful. Now, uh, is there a penalty to pay in terms of dose distribution? The, the answer is really no. Uh, here you have uh, an interesting uh, this, uh, diagram. In the lower half, you have the distribution from cobalt-60. In the upper half, you have the distribution from iridium. And it looks quite symmetric. That means they're quite similar. And uh, the only thing I can... Uh, C, I can point out, is the tip of the applicator where there is this bit of a dip in the iridium case and where it's actually more uh, continuous in terms of uh, cobalt-60. And uh, this comes, this is uh, quite explainable in terms of the anisotropy factor, one of these TG43 uh, factors. Uh, we have a more uniform isotropy in terms of cobalt as opposed to iridium. So it's actually in that sense better. Some other sources of interest, um, they're medium, mostly medium gamma ray energies. Why medium energy? Because as I will talk, we're uh, going into the era of more shielded applicators and intensity modulated brachytherapy well, you need a, a re relatively lower uh, energy to for the shield to work because you don't have a lot of space to put a lot, uh, a big thickness of shield. Uh, so you have these uh, radioisotopes, this kind of uh, energy range, and the half-lives are here too. These are uh, at the moment under study in, in, in some papers. So remote after loading units, uh, some history on that. Um, manual source loading, it was to begin with. Um, hot loading even, straight without even a needle going into the body. And then manual after loading, i.e. first inserting the catheter or needle uh, applicator, and then by hand putting something like iridium wire, for example. Still lots of problem with uh, radiation protection, uh, so, so came remotely controlled uh, after loaders uh, where you the operator would be outside the room, like for example in the setting of a linear accelerator. Uh, Rune Walston, a physicist at Stockholm in 1962, reported this. Um, this unit uh, had a single radium-226 or cesium-137 source. Other developments followed, of course. First HDR, high dose rate after loader, uh, it was called cathetron. Um, first at uh, 
Charing Cross Hospital in London, 1965. In fact, uh, Namazi Hospital, where I am at at the moment, uh, used to have one of these many years ago. Uh, source pencil containing multiple cobalt 60 sources was the geometry of interest is uh, this probe uh, that you see it's a rectal probe i a dosimeter and in, in vivo dosimeter to check the um, quality uh, and make sure the correct delivery even those years ago so um Another unit uh, which dominated the scene in many countries, including our, our center, uh, was the Selectron, um, 80s, 90s, around that time, designed specifically uh, mostly for gynecological brachytherapy uh, because it has six channels, uh, a tandem to ovoids, two parallel treatments. Of course, they take several hours, many hours to treat. Uh, so two patients could be treated uh, using uh, a cesium-137 source train. Uh, of course, there were de developments because of the value of HDR and practicality of uh, HDR. And uh, so they took over HDR afterloaders, uh, mostly using Iridium-192. Uh, as I said, more recently, also Cobalt-60 sources were miniaturized cobalt 60 sources could be uh, manufactured this was uh, then uh, uh, an option and commercialized another type is pdr pulsed dose rate what is that it is uh, basically trying to have the best of both worlds combining the physical advantages of hdr technology the machine looks like an hdr unit uh, that so that you can uh, have better isodose optimization, dual time, dual positions, etc., but also radiation safety too. But in cases where there is indication uh, for low dose rate uh, radiotherapy um, using an LDR approach, the story is that you give, say, a 10 minute, of course, in this diagram, it should be a 10 minute one here too, uh, 10 minute. Uh, burst or pulse of radiation, for example, and uh, once an hour, and that would it could be equivalent to something low dose rate, uh, in this case, half a gray for hour, per hour, um, if you do that. This radiobiologically would be equivalent to an LDR unit. And this, these are in clinical use. Of course, uh, Source, uh, any, any HDR you need, any unit you get, any machine you get, uh, you need to do a proper quality assurance and, and acceptance for it. Um, we had a uh, delivery of uh, the big Saginova version 124. Uh, and this was, uh, we, as part of the commissioning process, we measured the source transit times and uh, suggested in this publication that there should be something like half, uh, 0.2 to 0.5 second compensation uh, for that version that is uh, uh, for transit in typical cases. On to the use of images. Well, uh, why use imaging? Uh, what purpose? Well, uh, imaging is done, of course, with the applicators inserted in the patient to show the, the treatment. And that's used first to assess the implant quality, have, have the implant been done properly, and also use the pictures in the treatment planning. So some main developments, of course, there were uh, the old uh, pair of planar radiographs, AP and lateral, um, in a stereoscopic type of uh, situation, uh, geometry, of course, we assumed uh, water, homogeneous water, uh, then came tomographic imaging quite late on compared to external beam radiotherapy. I'll ex explain why. Um, that gave very good anatomical tomographic information, but not used for planning. Uh, still, uh, to date, most systems use uh, and assume water. Um, 
first came CT and then MRI became more and more prevalent. In parallel, ultrasound imaging has been used and is being used more and more. And now there's talk and use of uh, model-based dose calculation algorithms. What that, that means is these are tomographic images like CT or synthetic CT made of MRI, for example. But um, you now use inhomogeneity correction, proper dose calculation. Right, this is uh, the stereoscopic imaging. You know uh, about this, uh, an, for example, an AP and a lateral taken, a radiograph taken. And by knowing the position of a point in space from in these two, uh, if taken a proper isocentric uh, couple of uh, views, you can infer or, and you can use the, the position of that point in space and and this is done for the rest of the points like source points and also those calculation points right in uh, such a geometry you're only relying on 2d uh, data and of course you don't have a uh, good uh, tomographic 3d information in this paper like many other papers that were published on the shortcomings of uh, the 2d method, uh, we saw, we, we concluded that the wire, uh, rectal wire that was used so, to supposedly show the, the hotspot in rectal wall, anterior rectal wall, uh, was indeed not doing a, a good job and was underestimating the maximum rectum dose. Here's a nice table summarizing um, the advantages and disadvantages of uh, different um, image guidance techniques for cervix brachytherapy. Again, CT, of course, uh, availability, short scan time, um, CT compatibility is okay, and then they don't need to be MR com compatible, which is a more difficult situation, uh, and good visualization of the, the, seat, uh, the applicators. However, low contrast resolution of the CT as compared to MR means that you can't really see the GTV and you have to, for example, uh, control all of the cervix rather than just the GTV, which can be a subset. MR guidance is the opposite. We have better soft tissue resolution. You can see the superior border of the tumor, etc., much better, but you can't see the uh, applicator so well, reconstruction is difficult, the availability is much less, you don't have it in your department like you have a CT simulator, um, etc. And ultrasound guidance, uh, again, relatively cheap, widely available, there are spe uh, special types mostly for uh, US guidance uh, as well, um, real time, but there is no uh, planning system for them as such, and especially for cervix, that is, and uh, info, there was really insufficient clinical evidence. Example, here is an insertion on ultrasound, on CT, and MRI. MR is now the, the method of choice and gold standard, um, but we have to make sure that image distortion correction and other geometry corrections are made. Um, as a question, can you just use it on the first fraction? Many people do, uh, but some also on other fractions. I, I repeat that uh, the setting is that you have to, pretty much have to plan after if every reinsertion at every fraction and there may be i don't know eight fractions or something like that uh, there may be uh, uh, some cases but uh, or there is this preconception that you might need deformable image registration image fusion of mr and ct if you want to take uh, into account the external beam dose that was given before the brachytherapy normally this is done for cervix and uh, but there's a paper showing that uh, no you don't really because the dose distribution is fairly 
uh, uniform and you don't, it's a good estimate to do rigid image tra uh, transformation. Right, onto the applicators, uh, various types. This is the, the famous cylinder or the vaginal or rectal applicator given this famous sausage shape uh, dose distribution. Uh, and this is a coronal uh, CT of it inserted many times. You might not even need the, the imaging for this kind of a very simple geometry. Here is a, a version with, a, with shielding so that you could, for example, shield the rectum uh, in uh, so part of the, uh, the dose distribution is uh, omitted. Here's the, the highly dominant uh, tandem and ovoids uh, applicator, uh, Fletcher one here. Of course, these for MR guided radiotherapy are uh, many of them uh, nowadays can be uh, MR compatible. Um, and as you can see, the insertion intrauterine tube and the two ovoids. Another version of that uh, is the tandem and ring because of the, the more rigid structure, um, uh, it um, can be more uh, reproducible positioning. There are different indications for this. Um, development on this uh, was uh, reported, for example, here in this paper, the Vienna applicator has in the ring positions where interstitial needles can also be added. And I'll show you examples of why that can be useful. So you have combination of intracavitary and interstitial uh, radiotherapy. Um, right, this is a case where you have, you're comparing whether you didn't have these, this is the case that you didn't have these interstitial needles and interstitial needles is more, it's actually this case. And uh, you have uh, the, the high risk CTV in this case, getting about 65%, whereas in this case, you have a, a much better situation of a 90%. So these areas are, are better covered because you had some lateral extension of the target here. It's shown in another example. You see they have this famous pear shaped. This is not okay here because you had involvements here too. So by adding these wires, uh, interstitial wires here, you could um, take care of this and improve the dose distribution uh, quite uh, uh, specifically. So more other, uh, some more types of applicators. This is the nasopharyngeal uh, example with a balloon that uh, ensures immobilization and also has is inflatable so that you can um, uh, act as a space and reduce surface dose. Uh, here's a case of uh, an applicator for small skin lesions. Here's an interesting um, case um, where you're doing partial breast radiotherapy, a partial breast uh, boost, but without uh, invasion uh, externally, so to speak. Uh, these are the AccuBoost uh, applicators. Uh, you have this kind of circumferential uh, position where the, 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 the sources go, the wire goes and through, and it's under compression like mammography. In a mammography type setting, you get mammo mammograms, and also you have uh, the, the radiotherapy from both sides. And of course, um, you have this compre done under compression. We looked at this uh, in this paper uh, in 2015 on the, the fact that uh, if you have tomographic imaging, you couldn't do it under compression, you might have it uncompressed, but then with compression, what happens to the, the dose and there is no real planning system uh, for this. And we used uh, um, final element modeling, Monte Carlo simulation and TLD dosimetry to uh, implement and assess this. Here's a, a very busy diagram, but very informative one. Uh, I won't have time to explain it all, uh, but it introduces something called in 
intensity modulated brachytherapy. Uh, that's uh, basically using applicator shielding either statically or dynamically, dynamically meaning that it, it, the shielding moves uh, in different ways, of course, in these cases, uh, to, to give you uh, intensity modulated uh, irradiation uh, in the direction that you want. It's also called uh, direction modulated uh, uh, brachytherapy or anisotropic um, brachytherapy. Um, 3D printing, we've all heard of it. It's come to uh, the help of something called personalized brachytherapy. Um, in several aspects, this is one uh, that I'm showing image uh, based on imaging. You design the, uh, the, the, the paths that you would like these needles to go through and then it goes and actually builds, uh, uh, fabricates these needles and you insert them as before. So these are 3D printed personalized uh, applicators. Right, let's go to treatment planning. Of course, uh, first came the 2D brachytherapy planning systems. Uh, you had uh, an opportunity to digitize the 2D radiographs, the AP and lateral radiographs. And then uh, from there on those images, you could uh, locate, localize the sources and also like, for example, the Manchester system, 8.8, etc. Um, for your planning. Um, but of course, there was no tomographic data. Uh, we had, uh, we used that up center uh, for some time, uh, a, an in-house version of that, where you had the, um, we, in this case, we, we benchmarked it against uh, Plato, a commercial system. Our system is called STPS. In this paper, we report on its commissioning and, uh, and, and also its uh, benchmarking against Monte Carlo calculation, TLD, dosimetry. And interestingly, uh, this tip of the applicator issue again is seen where you have really, in reality, you have a dip, but these planning systems, uh, both the commercial and the in-house, don't see that and, and assume that the, the line continues. Otherwise, quite good uh, agreement. Of course, image-based and 3D uh, TPSs came along and various versions that have become more and more complicated and with more and more uh, capabilities through the years can uh, do applicator reconstruction. You have to do that before the planning and uh, you can see the dwell time and positions, etc. It's useful here to go through the workflow when you have such a system, image guided uh, and 3D planning. You have, you go ahead and do the implant. Uh, you acquire images. Uh, you go to this planning system, you reconstruct or digitize, so to speak, the, the catheters, um, applicators. And then you have like external beam planning, you have targets and OAR, organized risk delineation. Uh, then you go ahead and do your treatment planning, optimizing, um, you have quality control after that, and you deliver. Optimization of the planning. Plan optimization is, is quite a field. Um, um, it's without uh, invest planning, it's quite experience based and it's quite skilled work uh, to, to know how to set up the dwell times and positions. Um, there are things like graphical optimization. For example, if, if you wanted, say, you wanted to cover this either the green isotopes wanted to cover here you can grab this and take it to here and in it 
adjust the, the dwell positions and times to do that for you. It's, it's quite incredible and quite beautiful to see. Um, inverse planning, however, similar and analogous to what you have in external beam IMRT uh, is also used in especially HDR where uh, what, what you wanted uh, is where the dwell positions of the stepping source should be and how much you know uh, how much the radiation should it give in each position i dwell position and dwell time uh, based on your dose volume objectives and constraints there are a number of uh, strategies and a number of uh, algorithms for uh, this and there's no time to, to go through them but there's a quite a recent uh, paper in medical physics i invite you to uh, read this review of the algorithms. One of the things that uh, these uh, in invest planning algorithms produce uh, and you can see is that they don't have the usual uniformity that you might see when uh, somebody experience goes and uh, plans uh, and and, and the, the, there's a sort of low gradient between adjacent uh, dwell positions and dwell times follow a, a reasonable uh, gradient. You might have really big peaks next to it, nothing. This kind of thing can happen. So an improvement was proposed, uh, called modulation restriction. For example, in Saji plants called the dwell time homogeneity error weight parameter, same thing. Zero means it's not enabled at all. One is its full application. We studied this and, uh, well, first of all, what's wrong with this? This is not so good if you have, for example, unwanted movement of applicators. This could be quite disastrous uh, in, in terms of underdosage target to target and an overdosage of uh, normal tissue. This is more friendly, but the, the plan conformity index and, and quality indices do deteriorate, unfortunately. So uh, there is a trade-off with that, and this is uh, discussed in this paper. Right, uh, artificial in uh, AI and deep, info uh, deep learning, artificial intelligence has of course come to the aid of brachytherapy too nowadays and there's it's called something called intelligent inverse treatment planning that has been proposed uh, that does this uh, beam optimization plan optimization for you another interesting uh, development that can be used for various types of uh, applications is the use of electromagnetic tracking i.e. transducers and uh, transmitters who, which, uh, which send uh, signals to say where they are. So that can be, for example, used to, to make sure that the, the cable or the, the, the guide wire is, is fully inserted to the tip of the applicator. It can be used for applicator reconstruction, for example. It can be used for verification when it's inserted in the patient, uh, if it moves, etc. Um, nowadays, the 3D modern treatment planning systems are very complex uh, and there, there are lots of features and lots of things that need to be, uh, to be checked really. Uh, in this uh, fairly recent paper, review paper, we propose, this is uh, from our group, we propose uh, that a comprehensive template for commissioning uh, this type of TPSS. Uh, and goes through all of the aspects uh, of uh, what a TPS does and, and suggests how to uh, actually commission. On to those calculations as my final uh, section. It may be a question, why have uh, centers started using 
uh, image guidance in terms of those calculation or uh, so late or why are only model based calculations being talked about now um, this is because of physics because um, the dose distribution is, is almost totally governed by the inverse square law and not by how energetic is the gamma rays and how much they are absorbed and scattered. That's secondary of importance in brachytherapy. Uh, why is that so? Because first of all, we're talking about short distances that these rays should pass through. And of course, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, we're talking about soft tissues. And, and you saw with that comparison of cobalt and iridium that really energy of the gamma rays isn't that important in terms of the, 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 the distribution. So many uh, planning systems still use the, the famous AAPM TG43 algorithm. I won't have time to go through this, and well, very well known. It's an algorithm in uh, homogeneous medium of water calculates the 2D dose distribution around cylindrically symmetric sources like a tandem or, or a, a radioactive wire. Um, what, uh, how uh, realistic this is compared to what you have in practice has been the subject of several papers. This is one we uh, used, uh, you, we compared uh, what we measured and um, simulated using Monte Carlo um, with the with the TG43 and and came up with some uh, isotropy function values, for example, and other factors. We did a similar kind of thing uh, with a seed. Um, this is a, a type of seed for uh, interst interstitial brachytherapy and iodine. Uh, one, two, five, seed. This was published in medical physics. And um, there are uh, more and more systems taking advantage of or improving to go to model-based dose calculation algorithms. Again, there's no, not much to, uh, time to do this. This is a, a good review recently. Um, again, artificial intelligence, deep learning, uh, can do this for Dr. you Mosley, too. Your time is nearly over. Yeah, I, and I'm nearly done. I'm, I'm all, at the end. Okay. Thank you. Um, so AI can help you. You give it the CT images, contour the CTV and OIRs, and of course the treatment plan, i.e. the applicators, etc. And it goes and uh, calculates the dose quite accurately compared to Monte Carlo, for example, as shown here. Uh, these are uh, some of the Jack Estro recommendations for cervix brachytherapy one, two, three, and four uh, with developments I've been talking about, uh, interesting to read, and its culmination in the ICIU report 89. These are for further information. So to summarize, I hope, I hope I have been able to uh, point and highlight that modern brachytherapy is indeed high tech and it is continuously improving. There's, there's a long way to go yet. Uh, and that uh, along brachytherapy sources, after loading units, use of images, applicators, treatment planning, dose calculations, etc., etc., verification, and lots of other uh, aspects, which I haven't really talked about. Uh, there are many things I haven't talked about here. And we can see that the cervical uh, cancer brachytherapy, to some extent prostate, is the dominant form of brachytherapy and a dominant form of uh, what, what's been discussed in the literature. I need, I, I really should thank all uh, my previous and present uh, postgraduate research students who've worked on uh, brachytherapy listed here. I hope I haven't missed somebody. And uh, I'd also like to, of course, thank the APOM again, and also uh, the baby, uh, Kevin Ziegler, baby company, who have uh, supported some of our work. And I uh, thank you for your attention. 
and I hope that this has been useful. Thank you. Professor Hossein. Yes. Um, Are you going to put questions or uh, we should conclude now? You, you have to unmute. Please unmute, Hossein. Sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mosley, for your nice presentation. Uh, we had a uh, few questions. Uh, do you have my voice to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. The first question is from Professor Parsai. Professor Parsai uh, asks, could you please explain why the dose distribution of cobalt-60 came to that of iridium with over three times energy? Yes, indeed. Um, thank you, Professor Parsai. As you know, uh, attenuation is made of two things. Uh, it's the geometry factor like for example, in the external scene, PDD, you, you have decreased because you're moving away. Also, because there's uh, absorption scatter of the, of the uh, beam. So there is a geometric issue, which could happen in, in vacuum as well. You move away from the source, the intensity drops. There is no attenuation uh, scatter or absorption at all, but it, the intensity drops. This is the inverse square factor. And that inverse square factor or the inverse square part is extremely, extremely powerful when you're so, so close to the source and basically totally dominates what, how the drop of the, the, the intensity and, and therefore the dose is irrespective, almost irrespective of what the gamma energy is. So uh, the fact that uh, the energy is something like a, 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 a half or a third of the energy of, in, 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 of energy of cobalt is almost immaterial. Okay, thank you. One of the participants expected to know more about IORT, intraoperative bracket therapy. Um, do you have a brief explanation for yes, your yes. hair? Okay. Um, this is uh, quite outside the, the scope, um, the, but however, there is overlap. You have intraoperative radiotherapy, which can be delivered using external beam equipment, i.e. Uh, low energy x-rays or electrons, and there are dedicated systems for that. Or you can do it in a brachytherapy setting. You, you could actually open up the patient and insert, for example, iridium wires, etc. Uh, like the old days that we're doing that. So this is a, 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 an area between external intraoperative and brachytherapy. Um, nowadays, to, to my knowledge, uh, intraoperative is done more by using electrons or x-rays. We have an I or ERT unit in our uh, institution as well. I think we should now... Should I? Okay. okay. Yes, please. Uh, I think now, okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Hussein, for organizing such a wonderful uh, uh, FOM school webinar. Thanks to you for excellent talk. Thanks to Professor Parsai. Uh, even in the early, very early, you can say after midnight, he was from US there. Uh, thanks to Muhammad. Uh, uh, for his excellent talk. A lot of requests for your talk, they are there. Thanks to Professor Amin for your excellent talk. So though it was a very long uh, day today, we have uh, excellent uh, talks, radiobiology, physical, QAQC, everything uh, we could do. Uh, so I thank all the participants. We had uh, uh, the four excellent talks in these things and I already introduced. So next, uh, uh, we will be having a form RPI webinar on 31st of August. Already information is on the FOM website and uh, Dr. Rajini will uh, 
uh, send to participant the information. The 16th webinar, monthly webinar, uh, will be on uh, actually the 2nd of September, and uh, this will be on radiomics and uh, radiogenomics with AI for oncology. Speaker will be Dr. Arimura Hidetaka from Japan, and moderator will be Dr. Hui Yu uh, Sai from uh, Taiwan. That will be on September 2nd, 7 to 8 a.m. GMT. Then we'll be having uh, the fourth APOM school webinar, and uh, that will be on uh, 23rd October. We have another in September also uh, that will I will communicate. We have 21st Asia Oceana Congress of Medical Physics AOCMP 2021 during 10 to 12 December. The abstract submission date is still on. Uh, it will be in the hybrid mode. Uh, you can participate uh, uh, in person or virtually. Uh, so with these things, uh, thanking you all uh, uh, for organizing this wonderful uh, the uh, FOM school and uh, hope to get uh, similar kind of uh, support and help from all the speakers will be communication uh, with uh, you. Thanks to the participant for uh, holding on for almost three and a half hours. Uh, there was initial little bit difficulty, but yes, we did it. So once again, thanking you all and uh, look forward to meet on 31st August for the FOM RTI. Then second of uh, the uh, September, and then I form school and all those things. With these things, uh, stay safe, have a nice time. Uh, we say goodbye to all of you. Thank you very much for this wonderful listing. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Keep Thank safe. Thank okay. Yeah. Have a nice Thank time. Thank you very much. You too, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Goodbye.